Welcome, and thank you for joining the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, or IFES, in this discussion series on democratic resilience in Europe. IFES assists electoral processes, broadly defined, across the world, and we have supported elections in European countries since the fall of Iron Curtain. This is the 22nd installment in our series, and we have focused on issues ranging from election administration and inclusion, cybersecurity, disinformation targeting women in, elec in elections, abuse of state resources, and the role of Russia uh, in European elections. If you have missed any of our previous discussions, recordings are available on our YouTube channel, and my colleague is putting a link in the chat right now. I'm Nicola Tadiorshi. Uh, I am an IFES Senior Program Officer at IFES Regional Europe Office in Prague, Czech Republic, which is hosting this discussion. This event is part of a larger USAID-funded program of democracy assistance with the goal of supporting leadership that champions democratic practices and is made possible by the generous support of American people. So is the public discussion in our democracies an open dialogue or do malicious actors manipulate the debate for their own purposes? Meta, the owner of Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp, published a report in September 2022 about coordinated inauthentic behavior, which outlined several efforts from China and Russia to influence the public discourse in European countries and the US. In this online discussion, experts and practitioners will help us understand what is the impact of such influence operations and what can be done to counteract them. With us today, we have David Agranovich, Security Policy Director at Meta, David Levine, Elections Integrity Fellow from Alliance for Securing Democracy, German Marshall Fund of the United States, Bohumil Bob Kartos, Spokesperson for Czech Elves from Czech Republic, Peter Poyman, Criminologist and Political Analyst from Czech Republic, and Daria Azariev Nor, our Program Manager for Europe and Eurasia from IFES. After our discussions, we will open the floor for the questions to all our panelists. Should you have any questions or comments, you can already start typing those in using the Q&A function, which you can see at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, so David Agranovic, uh, let's start this discussion by, by uh, explaining what is the recently published meta report about, and can you give us an overall overview without going much into a detail? Yes, happy to. And thank you so much for having me for this conversation. Looking forward to the questions and the discussion. Um, so the report that we're talking about here is one of, of many that we've published over the last five years as part of an effort to try and, and do a couple of things. One, di disrupt coordinated and authentic behavior. These are influence operations, you know, networks of fake accounts on our platform that try to mislead people. Um, second, deter those bad actors from engaging in influence operations activity by publicizing what we're seeing and hopefully raising the costs on them for engaging in this type of clandestine influence activity. And third, inform other actors in this space who have the ability to take action themselves um, which is why we do things like try to attribute these operations, try to identify who they were targeting, identify the content that they were posting. Um, because as, as you'll see in both of these operations, these types of networks operated across a, a wide number of different internet websites, social media platforms, petition websites, and the like. Um, the report here contains threat intelligence analysis from our threat intelligence teams. These are experts who work for Meta, who conduct deep dive investigations with both local knowledge and, and, and language capabilities into this type of activity around the world. And the report in question ta uh, talks about two networks, one operating out of Russia and the other operating from China. The Chinese origin influence operation ran on a number of different platforms, and it was the first one we have seen that targeted US domestic politics ahead of the midterms in the United States um, per, on our platform. Um, and of course, part of the reason we're having this conversation is because that Chinese origin operation also targeted Czechia's foreign policy towards China and Ukraine. The Russian network, which is also part of the report, was the largest Russian network we've seen since the, you know, um, Russia's renewed invasion of Ukraine in February. Um, and that network targeted mainly Germany, France, Italy, Ukraine, and the United Kingdom. 
uh, with narratives focused on the war, um, its impact uh, on Europe. And it used a pretty broad network of more than 60 different websites that impersonated news organizations, as well as fake petitions on websites run by Avaz and Change.org. Um, so happy to talk through those findings in more detail, but I know we're going to hit a bunch of these questions throughout the discussion. Thank you so much, David. Um, I'm going to approach uh, David Levine. Uh, so the meta report mentioned US as one of the primary targets of the inauthentic behavior activity. So David, can you tell our audience what kind of disinformation narratives were spread and how? Sure, Nicoletta. And thanks again for having me on uh, for this really important conversation. And just to go a little bit deeper than, than David had mentioned, I think I'll, I'll focus, I guess, on the, on the Chinese efforts because your question, of course, is geared toward you know me and my thoughts about the U.S. and, and Chinese effort. Obviously, was was targeted uh, targeted at U.S. audience more so. So, Meta's report goes through a few different clusters of activity. Um, that first cluster, the network goes, I think, spans according to the report from November of 2021 through September of 2022, done mostly in Chinese by fake accounts that had female names in English but male profile photos. Um, you know, which I think suggests, and others can touch on this more, sort of the crudeness, right, of this effort. Um, but the criticism there, of course, centered around the U.S., its foreign policies, surveillance, and alleged cyber attacks. There was a second cluster of network activity that was posted primarily in English, to a lesser extent in a couple of other languages, from March to April of 2022. And those accounts were posed primarily as right-leaning Americans, conservatives, and centered around a number of themes, including being sort of, um, you know, pro-Second Amendment, um, anti-abortion, uh, and also include things like claims of um, U.S.-run bioweapon labs in Ukraine, as well as critiques of President Biden and some other um, elected officials. And then there's a third, um, just real quick, a third cluster of activity that was also posted um, from April to August of 2022 that was predominantly this one in English. And those fake accounts were posed as sort of more left-leaning Americans, um, progressive types, uh, Florida, Texas, California. The themes included pro-choice messages, gun reform messages, um, and criticism of a number of uh, politicians, including sort of Republican, uh, Republican prominent Republican Party uh, elected officials like Senator Marco Rubio. Thank you, David. Uh, Bob, uh, I will turn to you. Uh, similarly to David, uh, would you talk about the Czech Republic case of these attacks from the report, how they were carried out and what was the focus? Yeah, as I said, uh, as a spokesperson to the Czech House, uh, I'm representing uh, uh, kind of the civic reaction uh, to the threats we are talking about uh, here. Uh, we can, uh, uh, or we uh, have detected the first uh, attempts to uh somehow uh talk uh in into the czech discourse uh, from the side of the russia uh during the crimea annexion or after that in 2014 it was the kind of the first uh, uh systematic uh disinformation campaign detected uh, here in uh, uh, czech uh, digital space and after that rollout uh, years of uh, the problematic uh, public discussion, social discussion about the immigration during the 2015, uh, 2019, uh, we uh, detected a really massive uh, influx of the uh, uh, foreign, uh, foreign, foreign uh, uh, inputs uh, from, uh, especially from the uh, Russian side. Uh, or the apparatus or the intelligent apparatus of the Russian Federation, uh, which try to uh, trigger uh, or polarize uh, polarize discussion in Czech Republic, uh, obviously. And uh, after that, uh, COVID came uh, with uh, its uh, with its part, and uh, it was really a huge influence of the disinformation uh, on the public discussion here in Czech Republic. Maybe uh, with all the adults. Uh, hit by some disinformation uh, in, in, in the Czech discourse. And after that, obviously, the uh, aggression, Kremlin aggression uh, on Ukraine nowadays, uh, which uh, brought a really huge and massive attempt to apologize uh, the Russian aggression and uh, uh, to uh, 
acts uh, in the favor of the of the Kremlin interests. So this this is the really brief history of the uh, contemporary uh, disinformation history uh, in, in the Czech Republic. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Daria, now I turn to you. Uh, we heard how these inauthentic accounts were spreading disinformation both in US and the Czech Republic. So let's zoom out a little bit in Europe, for Europe. Do you see similar operations going on across the whole region? Uh, thank you, Nikki. And uh, first, let me say hello. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you are. And thanks so much for uh, letting me have the opportunity to be a part of this great panel. Uh, to answer your question, um, this has been a persistent phenomenon for years across the region, uh, but it has been much more permeating in an unprecedented way recently. And uh, it's no secret uh, that such operations have been a longstanding tool in the Kremlin's playbook. Uh, but for China, um, this is a fairly new arena in which uh, they have been using to deploy the regime's broader global strategy. And the pandemic, coupled uh, with the backdrop of Europe's political landscape, uh, provided China with a big opening to do this recently. So China was able to use the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to create a more positive image for itself in Europe, um, building on what Bob mentioned. And uh, this was particularly noticeable in Western Balkan countries where uh, you were seeing narratives being constructed about how the West abandoned uh, the region while China was the only one there uh, to help uh, with vaccines, masks, and so on. And so in addition to this, uh, in the past two years, we are seeing how disinformation has become more mainstreamed and politicized, and more and more political figures are using disinformation as part of their election campaigns to gain support, votes, uh, sometimes this is done intentionally, sometimes unknowingly, uh, but for example, the ruling elites in Hungary and Slovakia um, have helped amplify Chinese propaganda in particular. And then uh, when it comes to Russia, uh, we can say that the war in Ukraine has been accompanied by, you know, a regional war in the information space. Uh, this information war uh, goes, you know, beyond Russia's traditional uh, zone of privileged interest. Uh, but it's worth noting that those traditional efforts also continue and uh, Kremlin's influence in Belarus, for example, is a prime example of this. Um, but then, uh, you know, the foreign influence that efforts that are surrounding the Ukraine war uh, are pervasive on many fronts. So, uh, for example, in countries like Georgia, Moldova, Poland, uh, we're seeing how narratives being constructed around the Ukrainian refugee situation um, is also contributing to rising tensions in these communities. And um, overall, this means that the two regimes are also working on this front increasingly together. So while Beijing um, has on the one hand avoided directly backing Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, it's also worked to amplify Kremlin propaganda in various ways on this issue. And a good example of this was uh, when the uh, Chinese foreign ministry uh, repeated Russian, you know, false claims that um, there was presence of U.S. biological weapons in Ukraine. Uh, and then there's Germany. Um, so in recent years, uh, China and Russia have been able to, you know, embed themselves in the economy, ingratiate themselves with the elites. And ultimately, this has contributed uh, to paralyzing the EU from forging a coherent and much needed strategy uh, towards Moscow and Beijing. Thank you so much, Daria. And Petr, uh, I turn to you as well. Uh, I think you bring a very interesting perspective into this discussion, because apart from uh, you being a political analyst, you are also a criminologist focused uh, focusing on organized crime uh, and security threats. So my first question for you would be, can we draw any connections between this inauthentic behavior and organized crime? Yes, uh, this is, uh, hello, I'm sorry I didn't hear the beginning of discussion because there was a problem with internet connection. I'm sorry about this. Um, now it looks okay. Uh, in general, um, in my team, Team for Ukraine, we have a cyber group and uh, we were focusing on this topic from the 2014. And there is one very important conclusion. Um, 
here in the EU, in the US, um, it has a little sense for cyber experts to to be uh, to be member of organized crime groups or to work for them because they can make a big money in legal sphere and this for there is no in fact there is no motivation to join the criminal groups uh, so we have a we have a cases when uh, cyber experts are in uh, this criminal environment but it's not so often in russia especially in russia uh, in ukraine and in general in post soviet space this is quite usual so we have the old stuff organized crime we have uh, even uh, uh, organized crime which is following this old school matters old school romanticism one of the example of this may be also the head of the private military company Mr. Prigozhin, which is in fact a member of a criminal group working simultaneously for Russian secret services, involved in cyber crimes because there was a fabric of bots under his command, and you have a private army. Now, more and more members of this private army are the uh, guys with long, uh, long prison experience. So, in this case, you have everything in one person. So, everything is, everything is uh, connected. Uh, and this is quite specific, especially for this post-Soviet space in Russia, when organized crime is uh, connected into into the uh, uh, when when our cyber crime is interconnected with the organized crime, uh, and plus it's used by uh, secret services because earlier the only reason why it was working like this was a profit to make a money. Uh, there were even uh, guys in prisons working as a cyber experts or let's say hackers from 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 the prisons. Uh, as a result, we had uh, they had some profit, but now as it's used by the special services, it's, it's used by, as a weapon, as a weapon. And uh, this is something very specific. Thank you very much, Peter. So in this first round, we talked about the report. What is the report about? But let's now conceptualize it. So back to you, David Agranovich. Um, so why do you publish in these reports? Why public governments, NGOs, civil society need to know about it? Yeah, so we started publishing these reports in 2017 with the first influence operations takedown that Facebook did. Um, and the reason why, I mean, it was twofold. One, I think it would surprise no one on this call that Facebook had a lot to learn in 2017 on the issues of how to com counter influence operations, particularly after the platform had missed the Russian interference in the US elections in 2016. Um, and so one of the reasons we started publishing the reports was because, quite honestly, no one would trust us if we said we were tackling the problem, if we weren't extremely transparent about what we were seeing. The second reason we published these reports, the reason we still publish them today, is because a cross-societal problem requires a cross-societal solution. Um, and so oftentimes with these networks, all that what we see most, what we're best able to analyze, is activity on the Facebook platform. And we can often glean a lot of information. We can attribute these operations to who might be behind them based on technical or behavioral data that we can see on Facebook. But what we can't do is take action on the entire network across the internet. And increasingly, I mean, if you look at either the China or the Russia operation that sparked this conversation, both of them were active on tens of different internet websites and platforms. And in many cases, were also operating kind of off platforms, right, using more traditional intelligence tradecraft. So the main reason we publish is to enable other societal actors who might have deterrent levers or the ability to shape these operations in other ways to do so, right? As a platform company, we can take down networks, right? We can take down people's accounts. We can attribute the activity where we can, and we can share data with researchers. But that's kind of where our you know, effective levers end. But governments can indict uh, conspirators. We saw that with the U.S. government's indictments of internet research agency employees and GRU officers. Governments can sanction organizations, as we saw with uh, the sanctions on Wagner and the internet research agency and Yevgeny Prigozhin himself. Um, and governments can also conduct more uh, holistic intelligence analysis and collection activity. 
Um, but similarly, researchers and civil society, I mean, some of the folks on this call, all right, um, Bob's group, for example, do incredibly important investigative work across the internet and can pull some of the threads together that even our teams might not be able to. Um, and so by sharing this data, I think one of our other goals is to enable that kind of research um, where understanding the threat in a more holistic way is possible. Thank you so much, David. So Bob, I will now turn to you. What concrete impact does this inauthentic behavior has on the Czech Republic as a country and its online space? Maybe at, at first, I, I would like to correct a bit that uh, this uh, kind of the inauthentic behavior is only a part of the problem. Uh, because uh, in other words, uh, very small number uh, of the uh, inauthentic uh, uh, actors can uh, inflict a huge uh, avalanche effect uh, among the population. Yeah? For example, there is uh, detected only the few uh, people in Czech Republic, uh, they actively try to spread programming propaganda. But uh, we can detect some of the 15% of the adults in Czech Republic. Uh, they are vulnerable, very sensitively, uh, to this kind of the manipulation. Yeah, it means that it is kind of like a virus. Yeah, you can put it into the network, and uh, through the network, it uh, will spread uh, to uh, to those people they are uh, vulnerable to be infected with, with it. Uh, with it. Uh, so uh, this is uh, this is the first uh, first thing. Uh, what we can see uh, in Czech Republic uh, when it comes to the impact is that there is a kind of the growing synergy uh, between the, those foreign actors, especially from the Russia, because uh, we can talk later about the China and a bit a different approach uh, to the manipulation of the public opinion in Czech Republic. A synergy between those, they try to uh, actively spread the program and propaganda and local actors or stakeholders, especially uh, uh, the political parties, Parties, the populist political parties, they try to uh, use the content, this information content, uh, to cement somehow their, their political marketing and uh, uh, very successfully because there is a very simple formula. If those people they believe uh, to the proclaiming propaganda, so we can uh, use this content uh, for free in our political marketing and uh, it is very cheap for us to use this content uh, as kind of the uh, uh, something what is uh, what is uh, uh, reflecting the sentiments uh, of uh, the part of the voters in Czech Republic. So the direct impact of the uh, disinformation campaigns uh, is a change of the uh, political situation in Czech Republic, uh, especially uh, in some. Uh, elections. We are uh, we are uh, in the campaign before the presidential elections in Czech Republic, and we can see uh, nowadays and for the months uh, before that there are some candidates that are targeted by the disinformation campaigns uh, very purportedly. So we will talk it, uh, about it later. Thank you, Bob. Uh, my next question is for Petr. Uh, can these online operations impact national security? And if yes, then how? I'm sorry, there is some problem with the connection. So hopefully you can hear me. I don't know about the last, my answer was okay. Everything, okay, I'm sorry for this. Um, no, what I see, uh, uh, what, what I see for now, uh, what I see for now, I don't think that, like, in my country, but, you know, I'm not so, uh, so often working here, I'm more focused on Ukraine, so I may not be, I may not be correct, but in general, I don't think that after, especially after the February, uh, after the February 2002, uh, the, uh, the Russian propaganda lost a lot of uh, loyal supporters here in Ukraine, here in here in Czech Republic, uh, because it's not uh, supporters of the Russian politi politics and Russian war in Ukraine. There is a quite small people who 
can can publicly show this support i think but uh, which is working and uh, this is something the russian uh, are trying to do also in ukraine that by attacking uh, by attacking different uh, intra infrastructure sub uh, buildings like a power station uh, electrical uh, substation and things like that and i was observing this in Kharkiv for several last months. Uh, they are trying to make a life uncomfortable for people. So you have no military. Uh, um, it's, it, it has almost no military sense because the front line is moving uh, more east and more south. Uh, but it may change the mind of people. So people can force its government, in this case, Ukrainian government, to to, to, to start some negotiation about the peace or capitulation for any price because, you know, we are so cold at home and it's so expensive. So in Ukraine, it's not working. Because I speak with my, I'm in contact now with my friends and they are in Kharkiv and like, it's not comfortable. We are trying to be ready for everything. Yeah, we don't have electricity because it's uh, in, in some places that there is uh, supplies of electricity and uh, now the winter is coming. Uh, so it's very uncomfortable, but th this is not reason uh, for us to change our approach to our enemy. But partly it's working here in, in, in Europe, uh, in, in my country. We have seen the demonstration against the high prices of electricity and uh, everything and, and gas and everything. It's also used in the political context by some political parties. So it's not pro-Russian politics. They are not saying it's okay that uh, Russia is attacking Ukraine and occupied part of the territory, but let's talk with them about uh, about the business. Uh, and in this case, I see it's not working in Ukraine, but we see in, in some some results of this uh, Russian tactic uh, is reaching its goals here in Europe. That the, 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 the groups of people who are trying to Press to government that they should that the government should talk with Russia about this practical issue. It looks it's it, it, it's working partly. So this is of course influencing local local uh, state security. Let's say. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, Daria, now I turn to you. Why is foreign influence and inauthentic behavior mentioned in the report a problem? Well, uh, at its core, uh, it undermines the integrity of democratic processes. Um, it poses a serious threat to the fabric of democracy. And uh, we can say that the more that this threat gets pulled on, uh, the more it can unravel um, democratic resilience um, and stability in the region. So I say democratic processes more broadly, uh, because while we know that, you know, such an such operations uh, can be and have been a very large threat to electoral integrity, uh, as we've also seen, you know, here uh, in the U.S. with elections. Um, these narratives are competing for people's attention on a daily basis. Uh, so as we see from the meta report, uh, for example, um, it's not just in the context of elections, uh, but also aiming to manipulate how people, you know, take in the news every single day. Um, their moods, their opinions, how they see the role of their government, and also how they see their own role in society. So all of this uh, contributes to overarching uh, concerning trends uh, that we're seeing in the region, um, such as democratic backsliding, uh, lack of trust in public figures and state institutions, um, and polarized societies, uh, and overall disillusionment and apathy. So um, on that's on one, the one hand. And on the other hand, you know, you have China and Kremlin's um, collaboration to reshape the global information landscape. And this is designed, you know, to serve their authoritarian uh, political aspiration. And they are capitalizing on these vulnerabilities while also seeking to exacerbate them. So um, although Russian and Chinese interests diverge in, in some critical ways, uh, they're collaborating more and more um, in the disinformation and that they are disseminating um, in Europe and then the narratives that they are be spreading. 
Um, and this is all, you know, in an effort to fulfill their goals for the global order. The difference here is that, you know, while we're much more aware of the standard Russian tactics and tools um, for such foreign influence operations, um, there's fairly minimal awareness about Chinese activities, uh, strategy, and the impact of this behavior across Europe. So uh, countries having a better understanding of this threat and raising awareness is uh, one of the first key steps. Um, and uh, it's also very important in the context of the war in Ukraine, because uh, the legacy of this war will, of course, have longstanding implications, not just for Ukraine, but for the entire region. Um, and this includes the problem of also addressing um, disinformation inside of these regimes as well. question for David Levine. So David, Daria just mentioned the impact on election integrity, and you are an expert in this field. You observe many elections. So my question to you is what impact can, can inauthentic behavior has on election integrity? Sure. Um, Nicoletta, that's a really important question there. We could probably have an entire um, session on that, but let me just sort of touch on a few things. One, you touched on my experience observing elections right around the world. Um, and I think one of the things for those of us who observed elections is how, in fact, right, this can actually impact election observation. I mean, you know, many election observation missions have traditional media monitors, right, that have contributed to efforts by seeking to identify media bias, inaccuracies, misuse of state resources. But when we see technological advances and we see disinformation and inauthentic behavior, um, that presents, frankly, unique, uh, evolving challenges to election observation. And, you know, you can do things like have increases in fact-checking organizations and verifying official sources. Um, but, you know, this certainly makes it harder, right, to be able to separate the good information um, from information or can set, make it harder to separate the good information from that that's not. Um, and so certainly, you know, for election observation efforts, that's a piece of it. But for more broadly speaking, I think there are a couple of things that really come to mind. You know, if these efforts, right, and coordinated inauthentic behavior efforts are successful, and to be honest, right, as Meta sort of points out in this report, there are a number of reasons to think that this was not particularly successful, which we can talk more about, David began to touch on. But if one is successful, that can affect people's access to high quality, accurate information, which is critical to ensuring election integrity. Right, you can manipulate voter information or civic information. The research shows you can dampen voter participation. You can lessen trust in electoral management. Uh, and as a former election official, I'm keenly aware of that. Right, both obviously here in the United States, but where I observe overseas, um, and and that's really important because, of course, in healthy democracies, voters should be able to relatively easily make informed choices about how to vote. Um, and in, inauthentic behavior can make it harder to go about finding some of that accurate information to make those choices. The final thing I think that's also worth noting, particularly for this audience that I'll just mention, is it can make it harder to have democratic elections with a level playing field. This is something that IFAS, NDI, and others have sort of talked about. You know, universal equal suffrage, right? In addition to voting rights, includes the right to seek to be elected to public office without discrimination. Um, there are government obligations that are derived from this norm. The UN Human Rights Committee has talked about this in its general comment, I think it's 25, to the ICCPR. And, you know, that talks about providing security, among other things, from defamatory attacks, other false uh, forms of information. And that has the ability to ha potentially harm a candidate or a political party's electoral fortunes. And so, you know, these things, if successful, can have significant consequences on, on the integrity of elections. But to Daria's point, obviously, this goes well beyond simply right the conduct and, and integrity of elections as well. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Daria, I will turn to you. Uh, let's start moving to, towards the solutions. But for now, let's stay in the area of principles. So what can countries do to be more re resilient? Well, that's a great question. Um, we talk a lot about resilience, uh, but I think it's not just about democratic resilience, but also democratic persistence. Um, because at its core, at its definition, you know, the concept of resilience is about the ability to withstand challenges. And this is, of course, important, especially in the current context. 
Um, but we also need to build up our democracies so that they're more robust and they have better foundations. And so uh, while democracies in Europe um, need to be able to bounce back from these current challenges, um, they also have their own inherent challenges right now, um, as I mentioned. And this is what provides regimes uh, with the opening that they need for such foreign influence operations. So we're seeing that authoritarian regimes, you know, operate in a similar manner. They tend to work together. Um, the Kremlin has a well-established playbook, um, but we also have an advantage here because we see this threat and we do have the means to counteract it. Uh, so out of this crisis uh, comes an opportunity for us, um, and that is we need to build up uh, our democracies. And how do we do that? Um, well, one of the greatest tools against these regimes is building people's awareness, uh, building the collective mind, ensuring that people have a choice uh, in what they think, and above all, the right to determine their own future. Um, these regimes are terrified of such civic awakenings. Uh, a good example of this is Belarus, where the civic awakening um, is taking place and it is showing, you know, a sign that uh, Russian foreign influence is, is weakened, but it's also showing that the Kremlin is trying to adapt to those new circumstances. So ultimately, this shows us how important it is to uh, look at citizens in the digital age. Uh, we need to be creating empowered citizens uh, who are mindful consumers of information, uh, people who are aware of their rights um, and don't just consume whatever comes their way, but um, know how to find credible information. And that is really one of the most powerful ways uh, to build strong civil societies and democracies. And um, on that note, uh, interestingly, uh, strategies for countering authoritarian propaganda can actually give us some valuable lessons uh, for broader civic education programming. Um, because if you think about, you know, how do you reach the average person who has been brainwashed and ingrained um, with propaganda, you know, especially if you're trying to reach them, you know, with lofty principles of uh, democratic rights and, and civic activism. Well, um, in order to do that, you have to hook people and you have to show them why is it of interest to them? You know, why should they care? How does it relate to them? Um, and these messages should be felt on a personal, tangible level um, in order to be effective. And in addition to expanding uh, civic education and awareness, you, of course, have to build and protect democratic infrastructure. So, you know, building on what David was saying, um, this, of course, includes electoral processes, uh, holistically uh, advancing the capacity of democratic institutions and their ability to respond to various crises. Uh, so that citizens are able to have more faith in them. And then finally, um, also building on what uh, David Agranovich was saying, you know, we have enormous power across sectors uh, that isn't being tapped into. So we need to be having proper dialogues uh, across different stakeholders uh, so that we're communicating and cooperating, learning from each other, sharing experiences, um, and, and talking about lessons learned and good practices. And if we do that, uh, we should be able to build the capacity to address these challenges and uh, create stronger, more, inc more inclusive democratic societies that um, are less vulnerable to such foreign influence operations. Thank you so much, Daria. Uh, and next question is for David Agranovic. Um, and you already touched, Daria just, just touched on these things and you touched uh, on the same issue. But uh, Daria mentioned the cooperation between various uh, stakeholders. But Meta is a private company. So why is it important to cooperate with different stakeholders like governments, like public institutions, like law enforcement or civil society, for example? A fantastic question. So the, the first, I think the most um, upfront reason is the only way to effectively counter operations that target all those different parts of society is by having each of those pillars of society engaged. Um, and in a couple of different ways, right? So private companies have a fundamental responsibility to protect the people that use their platforms and to do what we can to ensure that our platforms aren't being used in deleterious ways. Um, I do think, you know, we're, that the disinformation space is, is unique in that right now, some of the most comprehensive investigative work is being done by open source investigators, civil society groups, and private platform companies. Um, when traditionally that type of intelligence work was generally the remit of governments. Um, 
there is a space here for governments. I think it's in two particular places. The first is as these operations become more cross-platform, and particularly another trend we've seen is a move, particularly from um, nation state actors, back to traditional kind of intelligence tradecraft that we would have expected to see in the Cold War, right? So the use of real world proxies, um, recruitment of prominent political figures, uh, clandestine funding in elections, um, the responsibility of law enforcement becomes much higher because they are probably the only ones who actually can see this happening and have the legal remits to investigate it. Um, the second thing that that means is that it can enable um, platform companies to do better investigative work. Um, there are probably threats out there on the internet that are not on Facebook yet. Um, we see a lot of these networks move to smaller or less policed platforms, right? Uh, Telegram, for example, has been probably the hotbed of coordination around disinformation activity targeting Ukraine. Um, and civil society groups that investigate activity on Telegram or law enforcement organizations that might have leads from off of the platform can help enable us, for example, to be ready and looking when a threat comes to Facebook from one of these other places. The last thing that I'd emphasize the importance of this cross-societal work is the, the need for clear regulation and norms in this space, both on social media platforms and our responsibility. But even maybe just as importantly, regulation focused on some of the industries that drive the disinformation activity online. Um, many of the operations we see these days are part of what I'd call threats for hire, whether that's surveillance for hire activity um, by cyber mercenary groups like the NSO group or disinformation for hire activity by PR agencies or marketing firms that might sell fake account networks like we see with some of the lower sophistication Chinese operations or groups like the Internet Research Agency, which at its core is a private company um, operating in a PR and marketing capacity for a government proxy organization. Um, today, we've taken down tens of these groups. Many of them still operate as PR and marketing firms with prominent clients across Europe. Um, so I think there are questions here about how the bad actors can be held more effectively accountable, but that conversation only happens with civil society and government involvement. Thank you so much, David. Uh, and back to David Levine. Uh, we know, we now know that the online space does have a huge impact on election integrity. So what are the key aspects for solution in this area? Sure, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. I think I'll, I'll touch on just a few um, that I think are really important and, and that others have touched on, but it's worth amplifying. So I think one is there needs to be sort of greater attention and resources to promoting election integrity. and and to be fair, I think you know, whether it's Meta or civil society, I think there's there have been greater efforts in a number of places across the world. But I think those efforts need to continue, right? Whether we're talking about public authorities, international organizations, philanthropic foundations, right? We need to be investing in tech talent and digital capacity, media efforts, and election management bodies that protect and promote electoral integrity, um, so that we're not sort of in a position where we we find ourselves constantly playing defense reacting to whatever the latest issue may be, right? We're, we're in a more proactive posture. Um, and I think, you know, to, to a point that others have made, that you know, the reason this is so important, of course, is, is that we want to be encouraging and having greater cooperation, collaboration, and rapid sharing of information related to threats to election integrity. Um, you know, um, if government wants to be, able, you know, ideally, right, government would be able to very quickly Right, if they're if they're aware of sort of disinformation across platforms, they would be able to be you know, be able to have access and be able to get information very quickly, without sort of having to sort of you know, go on a one by one by one basis, right, to sort of be able to do that. Um, and I think you know along those lines, and we've we've heard more about this, but I think it's really important to have tools that can assess increasingly um, which elections might require closer scrutiny, right, whether it's for potential election interference. Right or for things like mis and disinformation or even coordinated and authentic behavior, right? The topic of today's conversation. Um, I also think there's a need for greater technical assistance against threats to electoral integrity, right? By autocratic interference in elections. And when I say that, I mean it's important for electoral management bodies to have the help they need to defend their elections and receive assistance as quickly as possible. Uh, whether that we're talking about that's in the context of having electoral cybersecurity teams or other niche 
technical uh, uh, expertise that can help fill gaps. And I will say part of this, right, is making sure that everybody, myself, right, everyone here ought to be thinking about, are there additional capacities we can be providing to help election officials? Um, you know, are there tools that would enable election officials to amplify or put out good information close to election day? Um, and, you know, I know that this has been a topic of conversation, for example, with regards to paid advertising um, in the run up to election. But that's certainly, you know, needs to be met, but that's not the only place. And I think it's really important um, that that election management bodies have the resources that, that they need. And so, you know, again, I think, you know, just two things. One is uh, how do we sort of do right, more, promote more effectively electoral integrity and get these election management bodies the resources they need. And I do think this has particularly become an acute problem now, you know, when so many election officials, for example, across the world, you know, they, they were aware, right, they were aware of election or, or cybersecurity instances or threats from malign actors like Russia and China, but they perhaps had to take from those resources to try and make sure that they could run elections safely as a result of the coronavirus pandemic, right? We, we can't be in a position where bodies are having to choose between one or the other, right? They need to be able to do both and. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, David. And I turn to Petra. Uh, from the security perspective, what are the key aspects for solution that you see? Uh, here I would like to share the Ukrainian experience. Uh, as uh, this is something for us uh, hard to describe that uh, you are opening the internet and a big part of pages is not accessible. And it's exactly the, the case if you are in Ukraine, you in fact cannot access the uh, Russian inter internet in general. It's not working, it's, all, all, it's, it's illegal to can in theory uh, work with the Russian internet uh, V, with VPN, but um, uh, in fact, it's uh, 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 Russian websites to use the Russian email, emails, addresses uh, to use uh, Russian uh, social networks uh, like uh, contact uh, or classmates. It's forbidden for 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 Ukraine, especially for Ukrainian officials. And I remember, as I'm working there for uh, quite a long time. That even some Russia, some Ukrainian officials, including the heads of uh, police department or police uh, police guys, because we were working with the police, they were having uh, email addresses on the on the Russian uh, um, with, uh, on the Russian sites like Mail Mail Mail.ru or Rambler.ru. Uh, so this is something which is absolutely annex. Uh, un, uh, un which cannot be accepted during the war when uh, your enemy would be able to read your messages, would be able to see everything. And as you may know, uh, all Russian social networks or email uh, services are in fact easily controlled by, uh, by uh, Russian secret services if it's necessary. So, but even after the 2014, I, I have seen a, a, a lot of cases when the uh, Ukrainian police official or police department have, were having the email address on Mail.ru because it was usual. Till 2014, it was usual. Everyone was on uh, social uh, networks, contact or Adnoklasniki, so it's in English, it's classmates. Uh, and uh, were able to use the Russian, uh, and where it was usually to use the Russian email services. In one, in one case, uh, during the cyber training, we showed to our Ukrainian colleagues how it, how easy it is to read it, and that even uh, with uh, usual, usual hacking instruments, the ma mail rule is not very, very well, uh, very well protected. And we have we were sending an email uh, from the official Kremlin accounts to these addresses uh, with uh, heroes to Ukraine, uh, heroes to uh, to Ukraine, heroes to uh, uh, um, glory to Ukraine, uh, Slava Ukraine, and uh, they were receiving it to its primary uh, primary mess me messenger service. So uh, it was a very good example. Why not to use this? 
services. Uh, simul similarly, it is uh, it is with uh, it is with uh, it is with uh, social network. So now uh, social network. So now in Ukraine, all of these uh, services are forbidden. You cannot use it only with the VPN. Uh, uh, and maybe I'm talking so long. I have one more remark here, but uh, I can uh, say it next time. Thank you so much, Petr. Uh, Bob, uh, I will turn to you now. So you represent Czech Elves, a group that is actively uh, fighting trolls and disinformation. So can you describe for our participants what are the solutions to fight foreign influence and these inauthentic behaviors in Czech Republic? Yeah, thank you. The following Daria and uh, David uh, uh, speeches, I uh, need to stress, yes, in long term, uh, it is necessary uh, to build up uh, social resilience uh, in the national countries uh, by education. Yeah? Uh, this is uh, one of the most important uh, tasks, and uh, this is in the hands uh, of the governments. Uh, so uh, that's, that, that's true, uh, but this is a long-term uh, long horizon. Yeah? We can see some results in uh, maybe the uh, 15 to 20 years if we will uh, profoundly change, and I'm talking about a uh, uh, Czech curriculum, uh, the content of the education. So, so we are in, now in Czech Republic uh, in the midst of the uh, curriculum reform. But what we can see, there is a kind of the obsolete view of how to uh, reform the curriculum and uh, uh, what we, uh, but, but what we need in 21st century is. Uh, uh, more uh, gravitation focus uh, in the uh, social related uh, parts of the education. It means to raise up uh, the level of the uh, information literacy. And it is something that is uh, still, uh, after the uh, more than 25 years of internet, still new to the Czech education system. And it is it is not the only problem in the Czech Republic. Yeah. It's a problem, the global, the global one. Uh, yes, David uh, is absolutely right. We need to uh, cooperate uh, among uh, different partners, among, among the different stakeholders, uh, which uh, only enable some proper reaction to the threat of disinformation or cyber attacks. So, so that, that means that we need to raise awareness. Uh, about the problem uh, and what we can see in Czech Republic, uh, it is it is quite changing. Uh, the sea is changing in the uh, <laughs> good sense of this word. Uh, it came with the new government uh, in Czech Republic, uh, which is more active uh, in the countering or tackling the problem of disinformation. But it's still not enough. Yeah, it is. There are some some first steps. Uh, what I can see as a, a very uh, important indicator of the resilience uh, is uh, kind of the uh, kind of the reaction of the civic society. Czech elves, as the Baltic elves, uh, is a kind of this uh, kind of this spontaneous reaction uh, of the civic society, and this is kind of the indicator of the resilience. Uh, uh, two days ago, I been uh, to the conference in Vienna. Uh, together with the people from Slovakia, from the Western Balkans countries. And it is a quiet, uh, a huge gap between the situation in Czech Republic, where there is a strong uh, response in the civic, uh, civic society. Uh, if you compare it to the uh, state of things, uh, for example, in Serbia or Montenegro, yeah, absolutely different worlds. So uh, it is, uh, we need to uh, be aware uh, and knowledge that uh, the seriousness of the problem, or seriousness of problem, is different uh, when it comes to the uh, really, uh, uh, really different uh, countries in the central and the eastern Europe. And and what we need is a kind of the uh, common uh, common response from the EU, because when it comes to the negotiations with the big techs uh, in, in their hands. Uh, our platforms we are talking about. So we need to uh, kind of the uh, con uh, consent about that this is uh, the big problem, this is a big threat, and we need 
uh, to negotiate together with them because uh, from the position of the Czech Republic, 10 million uh, population country, uh, it is not easy uh, to take some, uh, some position uh, for the negotiations, negotiations like this. Thank you so much, Bob. So let's move uh, to the last round of questions, which uh, are going to be focused on the practical solutions. But looking at the time, I wanted to ask uh, kindly our, our panelists to keep the, the replies short so we have time also for the Q&A. So let's start with David Agranovic. Um, what are the practical solutions Meta used to counter inauthentic behavior? Yep. So, so I think shortly our, our, our approach is a combination of investigating the threats, right? Our responsibility is use the data we have to understand what's happening on our platform, disrupt those operations, take them down, not just the fake accounts, but the real accounts of the people behind the operation and any other assets that they have on the platform. So if they're running pages, groups, events, Instagram accounts, or otherwise using our services that we can take a holistic, broader action to try and raise the costs on a bad actor. Um, third, disclose what we're seeing, right? Share our findings and share findings with researchers. We built an archive, for example, for research organizations that contains all the content from networks that we take down. Um, and then lastly, scale our enforcement beyond individual takedowns. Something really unique about platform companies is for one of the first times in warfare, we control the terrain on which the battle is being fought. Right. We can move the mountains and the valleys and the rivers to make it harder for an adversary to use our platform to engage in influence activity. And so something that we do after each takedown is evaluate how the network used the platform and ask the question of, okay, if we saw, for example, Russian actors running pages in 2016, using the fact that our pages are opaque about who runs them, can we simply make an, autom an automatic system in pages that shows the location of the admins? Now, that's obviously not going to defeat every influence operation, but what it will do is force the admins running the pages to take significantly more sophisticated communication security steps, which will cost them more money. And if they end up messing up, people like Bob's group are going to identify them and then call out the fact that those admins look like they're coming from a you know, Russia instead of the United States or instead of the Czech Republic. So those types of steps, I think, are actually where platforms have the most interesting deterrent lever because it's something that only platforms can do. Um, the last thing I wanted to note, too, this, this product change and sharing piece, I, I think that platforms have one other important responsibility, which is to inform these regulatory conversations in a comprehensive and useful way. Right, not just to engage with regulation uh, defensively, but to be thinking about how regulatory approaches here can raise the quality of work across the industry. So it's not just Facebook or Twitter or Google voluntarily doing this work, but that this type of security work is something that is an expectation for platform companies to do, um, particularly platforms that are popular but don't necessarily do this type of work like Telegram. Thank you so much, David. Um, David Levine, uh, what are the practical solutions to strengthen election integrity in an online space? Sure, you know, I think David touched on a certain amount of what, what Meta is doing. I think it's worth noting that, you know, notwithstanding some of the fact that some of the actors, right, are better faith than others. And he made, a, I think, an appropriate contrast there. I do think there needs to be greater coordination um, and I could see even more coordination between sort of social media companies to sort of see what works and what doesn't. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think this gets at sort of his point and others have made about the, you know, until, I mean, there is a place obviously for greater regulation, um, but just like election officials within country and across the world are often sharing what works and what doesn't so they can become more resilient. I do want to see that, right, have, have it happening continuing to happen, right, with regards to platforms. I think that's really important. Um, I also think it's important that we're seeing um, civil society actors, um, social media companies, and others that are frontline partners integrating more closely with election officials, because I think we can see some success, right? I know that there was a case study done of Mexico's 2018 elections, right, that had some success in part because there was some closer collaboration and cooperation between right, the, the electoral authorities and some of those sort of civil society actors. And in some cases, we've seen some of that success too when we've looked at, for example, previous elections in not the most recent one in France, but the one five years before that. Um, and so I think that that's something that I think is, is, is really important. 
Um, the other thing, of course, that you know is harder, and others may jump in on, is that when we have you know bad faith actors, where possible, we need to be able to hold them accountable. Um, and I think that that matters. And, and, and I want to be very clear, right? Freedom of speech and expression, they matter. But obviously, if there are circumstances where people are pushing out information that has the effect of inciting violence, there needs to be accountability. If there are folks who are running for office um, and, and, and they somehow are right, dropping the ball there, there ought to be right, repercussions at the ballot box for them, right? So that they don't have that platform once they assume office to be able in any way, shape, or form, right? give further credence to some of the efforts we're talking about here. Thank you so much, David. Uh, Peter, uh, from the country security perspective, so what can governments do to counter spread of disinformation and foreign influence? Peter, I think you are muted. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, because of this internet connection. Uh, do you want I, me to I repeat do your? Do you want me to repeat the question? No, 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 no. no. Uh, because um, the the one one of the question is uh, one of the solution is, and we have seen it in we have seen it in uh, some occupied territories of Ukraine. Is that? Uh, uh, People were living in isolation, so there was nothing. There was no internet, no electricity. Uh, BTS stations, uh, and I have been visiting Izum. Recently, Izum is a city in uh, Kharkiv uh, Oblast, uh, Kharkiv province in Ukraine. And this city was living under isolation for six months, for example. Situation in Kherson now is different. It's a bigger city. There is a, there is electricity. Uh, there is an internet connection. You can even contact the people on the other side. But in Izum, it was not possible. So for for majority of the people, they had no idea what's going on around. Uh, and the Russians were using uh, local propaganda. Uh, now you can show this uh, these examples uh, of. Uh, local newspaper, old school paper newspaper, and it was the only source for local people. So there was no way how to, uh, how to find uh, uh, alternative information. So when we were talking with the locals, they believed, for example, that the situation outside of Izum is even worse. Uh, a similar situation was in Mariupol that people believe that uh, actually there is no uh, there is no Ukraine anymore. Uh, Kharkiv is uh, occupied, and there are some fates on the very, very west Ukraine. Uh, in this case, this total isolation was, of course, helping uh, to uh, this. Uh, to this, uh, you, you can you can show now these uh, newspapers from from Izum. I, I was sending to you, uh, and th this was the usual approach of the Russian occupation forces using. Uh, isolation of local people by in, uh, disconnecting them from internet. So BTS stations, all of them were almost destroyed. Uh, and only now it's fixed slowly. Uh, and the only propaganda on the places where uh, there was no internet and uh, uh, electricity connection was uh, these uh, newspapers, uh, the paper variant newspapers which was unfortunately working because this was in fact the only source of information because there was nothing else. It was not even possible to make a call. Uh, this was external variant, but it was used by, by, by them in, in, uh, in occupied territories. By the way, in, in, Chernivtsi, uh, in, in Chernivtsi region, we have found even the old wooden box. Uh, I have sent it to you by email so you can, you can, you can you can share it with, with the guys. Uh, uh, and there was a written, it's a political military um, uh, education box. So everything important was in this wooden box. So absolutely offline. Uh, and this old school approaches were, were used around the Ukraine. We were observing it <laughs> in many cases. Uh, Izium Telegraph, Kharkiv, usually with the letter Z. Uh, and uh, news about the victories of the uh, Russian forces around the Ukraine. 
Thank you so much, uh, Petra. And we posted the pictures in the chat. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, let me turn to Bob. Uh, so what are Czech elves doing in practice to counter inauthentic behavior and foreign influence in Czech Republic and online space? Yeah, as I mentioned at the very start of our discussion today, uh, we try to not to uh, directly fight anybody. Yeah? Uh, we are a group of hundreds of people um, with uh, relatively high education and uh, kind of the uh, sense of the values uh, we try to defend. Uh, and uh, what we uh, really do is that we try to collect and observe the situation, collect information and uh, analyze it uh, by the content and to show the people in government, in the media, in the broad public, what is behind, yeah? what, what is the uh, the real purpose of the of those activities because what we can see in the uh, the long time uh, for, for many years is that the purpose of the this information is uh, polarize uh, this discussion and to erode uh, the consent cohesion in the societies uh, together with the targeting of some uh, some goals like uh, EU or uh, liberal democratic uh, representatives uh, uh, in the different countries. So we try to raise awareness about it, educate people, and also we try together with uh, others in Czech Republic, we are not the uh, only ones, uh, that uh, create kind of the functional consortium or functional group network of organization and individuals they try to uh, show that this is really, it, it really matters. And that this is something what uh, government uh, should be uh, able to tackle or solve uh, in a higher level. And uh, also I'm a person who is uh, uh, for many years uh, engaged in the, in the education policy in the Czech Republic. So that what I try as an advisor to the Minister of Education, Mr. Balash, to persuade him personally and uh, the public in Czech Republic is really uh, necessary uh, to include more uh, information literacy into education. Uh, but it is uh, this long, really long, long run. Thank you so much, Bob. And uh, finally, Daria, uh, what is IFES doing in terms of practical solutions in countering foreign influence? Well, I'm happy to say uh, a lot of what we are doing currently actually uh, relates and, and builds on um, several of the solutions that we've been discussing. So uh, broadly speaking, at IFAS, we work with electoral stakeholders across uh, Europe um, to help them protect core principles of democracy and elections and respond to both all the new challenges in the space. Uh, one of the key mandates of our USAID-funded Regional Europe program is countering malign Kremlin influence and democratic processes. And we try to approach this uh, through a holistic perspective. So we believe that if we build the capacity of electoral stakeholders across several pillars, uh, this includes you know, technical assistance for election administration, but also information integrity programming, cybersecurity, political finance transparency, electoral justice, as well as civic education, um, then we will be able to build the resilience of those democratic institutions in responding to these threats and their ability to uh, serve as trusted institutions. Another big part of that is giving these stakeholders the opportunity to engage in peer exchange um, so that they can create sustain sustainable networks, um, share their experiences, common challenges and good practices, and learn from each other. And uh, then out of those peer exchange discussions uh, is often where we come to identify new tools and resources that we then develop for our stakeholders uh, to help fill the gaps and needs that we've identified through those uh, interactions. So a good example of this um, is our work with election management bodies on um, helping them counter foreign influence and disinformation. In 2020, we established a working group for election management bodies specifically for addressing this issue. Um, and out of those discussions, uh, we developed a crisis communications and combating disinformation playbook, uh, which is really uh, meant to serve as a tool and, and guide EMBs um, through effective approaches uh, to responding to threats of disinformation and different crises. 
On the cyber front, we also seek to help you know build EMB's capacity um, overall, and we're building new regional networks of EMB's uh, and their peers uh, with uh, shared threat intelligence mechanisms uh, for them to communicate with the tech industry also, so that they know what the latest uh, coming their way is, especially in periods ahead of elections. Um, and then, of course, foreign funding uh, and corruption is another key entry point uh, for malign influence in the region. And so we're working to foster more transparent systems. Um, this includes launching a community of practice that will connect stakeholders across civil society, society and state institutions uh, so that democratic actors can better uh, implement strategies that will increase transparency and accountability for the online conduct of um, election campaigns. And then finally, as I've mentioned, civic education and media literacy are vital uh, in equipping young people with the ability to discern propaganda and disinformation narratives. So um, we have a broad range of initiatives on this front, uh, which includes our civic education university course uh, that is now offered at more than um, 100 universities across Europe. Thank you so much, Daria, and thank you to all our panelists. Uh, we received many questions. We, are, we can now move to Q&A. Uh, we received many questions, but unfortunately, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Uh, I'm not sure we'll be able to reply to all of them, but maybe if, if our panelists would be willing, we can share the replies uh, in writing. But at least one question that came from Mike, um, it's um, for David Agranovich. Uh, what is the appetite for Meta and other firms to provide details to either journalists or trusted organizations that wish to pursue these problems and their perpetrators? I think the appetite is generally quite high. The There are some, I wouldn't say barriers, but just hurdles that we often have to get over. Um, the first is, you know, as a large platform, and this will surprise no one, Facebook has been under a lot of scrutiny, not just for our work on security, but also on our data handling and privacy practices. One of the main things that we have to do when we're working with external partners is a relatively challenging series of legal gauntlets in order to be able to share data outside of the company. Um, we've created an archive tool. I know there was another Q&A question about how to get access to that archive. I will follow up with the organizers with kind of the process that we're putting in place for civil society groups to apply for access to the archive. Um, but the biggest challenges are purely ensuring that we are sharing data in a responsible way and that when we share that data, we're doing it in a way that's compliant with mainly EU privacy regulations. It won't surprise anyone that this became much harder after the Cambridge Analytica situation where data sharing with academic institutions turned into unauthorized data sharing with private organizations. I will say though, on the journalism and civil society front, there's a handful of organizations that we do work very closely with um, to share takedown data ahead of our, our public announcements that lead to independent assessments of our own takedowns. You've probably seen these from the DFR lab at the Atlantic Council or from groups like Graphica or Stanford's Internet Observatory. This year, we're hoping to add a bunch of additional research organizations from other parts of the world uh, with the goal of next year being able to grow that number substantially. So I'll share the application information with this group. Um, just a concrete example, we partnered with, for example, CNN, right? so international broadcasting media, um, on an investigation into a Ghanaian troll farm um, that was targeting the U.S. in 2020 um, in Ghana. What's really cool about that was we were able to attribute the activity to the IRA quite high confidence based on on-platform technical evidence, which CNN didn't have. What CNN did have was a reporter, Clarissa Ward, who was willing to fly to Ghana and actually track down the location of the troll farm and confront the IRA employee in Russian about what he was doing in Ghana, um, which gave, I think, us and everyone else unprecedented insight into what this actually looks like on the ground. So I think that those collaborations can be super effective when we do them in the right way. Thank you so much, David. And again, thank you to all our panelists. Uh, as I mentioned, I will ask them if we can reply to all of your questions in writing and then share it with you. We have your details. So we, we have come to an end of our time together. Uh, again, thank thank you all the panelists. Uh, thank you for all the thank you for all the participants for their participation. I want to uh, thank again to USAID for supporting this event as well as my IFS colleagues. Uh, the next installment of this discussion series will be held during mid November, and a specific topic uh, for that event will be announced in the near future. Uh, I hope to see you all then, uh, and until then, I hope you will stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>